they intend to live at Ischia. When a man as famous as Monty retires, that's news. And it's the moment to review a life of outstanding achievement. He was born at St. Mark's Vicarage near Kennington Oval in 1887. The vicarage is now used as a boys club, but this is the room, and from it, as he grew up, he could watch the cricket. He was educated at St. Paul's School in London. If only an average scholar, he nevertheless made a name for himself at games, as captain of Rugger and as a star in the cricket eleven. After St. Paul's, he went to Sandhurst, entering the army, the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, in 1908. In World War I, he was wounded twice, mentioned in dispatches six times, and he won the DSO. World War II and the retreat to Dunkirk, he commanded the Second Corps during this critical operation. 1942 and another retreat, this time across the sands of the Western Desert. Critical days again, and the man for this crisis was Lieutenant General Montgomery. First a defensive battle at Alam Halfa, then into the attack with massed artillery at Alamein. lasted 11 days, but the Germans and Italians were routed by the 8th Army, as Monty had said they would be. This was a turning point in the war, the start of many battles and a long pursuit out of Egypt into Libya, and eventually he hit him for six, as he promised, right out of Africa. General Montgomery taking the surrender at Tripoli during the 8th Army's brilliant succession of victories under his command. At one place after another, the British flag was flying. Out of crisis and near defeat, victory had come at last. A general handing out cigarettes. He never smoked himself. He'd been shot in the lung in 1914, but there were fags for the troops. Bouquets for the general, and the general knows the form all right. Monty with General Dempsey and the prospect of a new campaign across the sea to the invasion and liberation of Sicily and Italy. Monty with General Freiburg, VC of the New Zealanders and the advance continuing. But Montgomery was not to complete this campaign in person. An even bigger command lay ahead. At the end of 1943, he was back in Britain. Workers on the home front got to know him. This was typical. Now, the great thing when you go fighting, of course, my business, as you know, is fighting. Fighting the Germans. Or oh, anybody else, too, who wants to have a fight. <laughs> he chose his old school, St. Paul's, as the headquarters for his part in the planning of the Second Front. Here, British and Allied leaders met. Here, with General Eisenhower, he made his own views on the great campaign crystal clear. There was Germany's West Wall to be smashed or overrun. There was Monty's old adversary, Rommel, to be defeated again. He was much in favor of that. June the 6th, 1944, D-Day. The time has come, to quote Monty's own words, to deal the enemy a terrific blow in Western Europe. In better days that lie ahead, men will speak with pride of our doings. Great Britain's part and Monty's part in the liberation of Europe is history now. Britain and her allies fought across the continent and into Germany. German prisoners in their tens of thousands. May the 4th, 1945. On Lüneburg Heath, five German officers salute the British Commander-in-Chief. They come to surrender the German armies of the North. Surrender unconditionally. And without argument or comment, the document is signed, the war is over, and after victory comes triumph. Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery visits some of the nations which he and his men had set free again. Holland and Denmark, for instance, and it was all pure joy. London and the victory parade. King George VI with Queen Elizabeth is there to take the salute. For the field marshal, surely this was the climax of a long and brilliant career. 
honoured by the City of London, he paid this tribute. But amongst those in the forefront, I place the unconquerable figure of the British soldier. Staunch and tenacious in defeat, kind and gentle in victory, the one man to whom the nation owes its heartfelt thanks. Windsor, 1946. He walks with Lord Alexander and other knights for his installation as a Knight of the Garter. His school is proud of the army class boy who became a field marshal and a viscount, and Lord Montgomery, now CIGS, is proud of his son David winning the belt of honor at the start of his career at his octu. Here as a godfather to Jeremy Soames, Sir Winston's eighth grandchild. The field marshal paying a visit to Soviet Russia is warmly received he put on the Russian rig they gave him, but he still looks British somehow. He visits America and takes command of the press. And I'm going down tomorrow to uh, Washington, stay with General Eisenhower in the White House for a week. Just hold it, hold it, hold it for a second. Hold it. Hold what? Uh, suppose a question will be. What's this chap doing down here? Uh, he's making a record. Ah, he's making a record. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold it. <laughs> How do you feel, General? How do you feel? How do I feel? I feel very well. I feel, I feel very well. Since 1951, he's been Deputy Supreme Commander, Allied Powers, Europe. He's served under several chiefs, but he's also had some pretty famous boys in his classroom attending his lectures on Western defense. Now, at nearly 71, he's going to have a rest. Well, nobody could say this general, who never lost a battle, hasn't won the right to take it easy. <laughs> <laughs>